Right, Ray's not helped me very much to leave the darkness of Catholicism so far, but I'm hopeful that he will do so at some point. So let's uh, carry on listening to him. Veneration of Mary. Catholicism honors Mary with titles like Mother of God and Queen of Heaven. The Bible teaches that Mary was the earthly mother of Jesus without elevating her to a status of divine intercession. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Well, it took him a bit of time to get to this one. The Protestants love, of course, going straight to Mary. It's like she's a lightning rod for them. Interesting to think about that, isn't it? Why the woman who crushes the dragon is a lightning rod for certain groups. That indicates something spiritual, in the spiritual realm, in my view. And it's not nice either, not a good thing to have to reckon. But let's deal with what Ray says. Ray is saying we call her Mother of God. Does Ray believe that Jesus is God? Yes, he does. Does he believe that Jesus was God at the moment of conception? in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. I think he does. I only think he does, I just don't know, because some Protestants believe that he became, the Son of God or became God, say, at the baptism in the Jordan. But I don't think Ray's like, I think he's more mainstream, holds most of Catholicism, which is what mainstream Protestants is, like 80 to 90 percent Catholicism. So if he believes that that was God in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, why not call her Mother of God? Was she the Mother of Jesus? Yes. Was Jesus God? Yes. Ergo, she is the Mother of God. Very simple. Why did this title arise? Well, it arose because there were those who were saying, oh, she's just the Mother of Christ not the mother of God, and there's a separation between the persons. There were two persons, a Nestorian idea, as it's called, the Nestorian heresy. They call, they call um, her the, the Christ-bearer, as opposed to the God-bearer. But in fact, you have to call her mother of God, and the Council of Ephesus in 431 required this in order to protect the dogma that Christ is one person. Not a person who's the son of Mary and a person who's the word incarnate. No, there's one person. Jesus has two natures and the subsequent council 451 AD at Chalcedon as he has the nature of man, fully man, and the nature of God fully God. These are not mixed together natures, they're united without mixing, without admixture. So we say Mary is mother of God principally to protect the central, a central doctrine about Jesus, but also because it's logical once you accept that Jesus is God. Ah, okay, but we call her Queen of Heaven Not scriptural, eh? Okay then. Who gave birth to Jesus, was I saying? Mary, you say in response. Hmm. Perhaps it's not biblical. But she's the queen of heaven, we say. Aren't we really, really out of order now? Nowhere in the Bible is she queen of heaven. Revelation 12 Verse 1, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth, in anguish for delivery.
This child, everyone agrees, is Jesus. So, the woman must be Mary. Now, you can say there's layers of symbolism here. There's the church. There's Israel. After all, Mary, we say, didn't have pangs of birth. She was a virgin throughout her life, um, during the birth and after the birth. So, Jesus was born in a miraculous way. When it states there were pangs of birth, that will be referring to Israel. But to say this is just Israel or just the church would be a mistake because there's a real historical woman in view here, clearly in view. And that woman, she because it's, the symbolism is in several layers, but they're not like one on top of the other, like a kind of sandwich. They intermingle. And so the 12 stars can symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel, or the 12 patriarchs. They can symbolize the 12 apostles. They are a crown, though, on her head. So there's no reason to believe that this is not Mary, and in fact, a literal reading, which is all a Protestant can really do, would suggest this is Mary above all. To say, to talk about the church in Israel is fine, but really, how can you do that unequivocally if you're just a Protestant scholar without any inspiration from God, without any authority other than your scholarly abilities? You simply can't know what God the Holy Spirit is getting at. The church in her liturgy speaks of this as Mary, though. And that's a divine thing, a divine liturgy. So Mary has a crown and she's got clothing, the sun. So she's up there in the sky. The moon's beneath her feet. She's in heaven. And just before that, get this. And these, this is, I started with chapter 12, verse 1. Prior to that, it's chapter 11. But there were no divisions originally. So go to 11, verse 19, which is the last verse of chapter 11. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. And then it goes on, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. And that's a fascinating conjunction. We've got the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, in the temple. And then all those meteorological phenomena. And then that sign disappears and a new sign appears. A woman carrying in herself a child. Mary is clearly shown by St. John and he was shown by God. She is the Ark of the New Covenant. The Ark bore the manna, the, uh, the um, Ten Commandments, and was it Aaron's rod as well? And we have in Mary the law, the law himself, the word of God. And it, of course, it's more splendid than the old ark. It's paralleled, in fact, when you look at Luke is it chapter 2, when Mary goes to see Elizabeth, whom Angel Gabriel has told her is pregnant. And she goes there to the hill country, um, Hebron, and she stays there for three months. And this parallels um, the journey of the ark uh, in the time of King David, a thousand years before. Mary is the, and that's, that's Luke, by the way, a completely different author from the author of the book of Revelation. But it all ties together because it's all from the mind of God, the Holy Spirit. Well, Ray digs up a verse, doesn't he? Despite me all saying, saying all that, he's got a verse here. A woman said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, more than that, 
Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So that's putting Mary in a place, isn't it? Well, not really. I mentioned St. Luke. So blessed, a key word. Mary, well, let's see, Elizabeth. She says when Mary calls her, when Mary's arrived, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary says, and this is verse um, 44, uh, 46, 45, 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. This is chapter 1, by the way, of Luke's Gospel. For he has regarded the lower state of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now you might say, you might try and say, all Christians are blessed. But of course, even if that's so, there's got to be some special blessedness which Mary carries. Because why would she, why would um, Elizabeth say you are blessed? Elizabeth was carrying John the Baptist. She was blessed too. And also Mary sings this canticle under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. All nations, so all generations will call her blessed. Now, Luke is quoted by himself, Ray Comfort here. Luke then is, is aware that Mary is the superlative blessed one. So when Luke writes these words of Jesus, it's clearly in that context. So why is Jesus saying this? Now we've got the context. Well, it's simply this. Uh, this, uh, this lady in the crowd, she's like very earthy, obviously. Oh, you know, you know you've, you've achieved so much. Your mum must be proud of you. Isn't she so lucky? She's great, your mum, because she's produced you. Well, actually, no, that wouldn't be the reason that Mary's great. Like, it's not, no woman is great because her son has done great things. But of course, in that culture, you know, in every culture, kind of there's an afterglow for the mother if the, if the son or the daughter achieves great things. But it wouldn't matter, you see. That's, a, that's an earthly perspective. And this lady in the crowd has that earthly perspective. And it's understandable, but Jesus has to correct it, especially for that kind of culture, where family and, and clan and kin and every, are everything. What matters is those who hear the word of God and keep it. You know, again and again, Jesus is breaking family bonds, or he's saying family bonds are less important than duty to God. It seems to run through Luke a bit, that theme. And Jesus has to hammer it home because there are going to be people who are going to try and stop you from following your mission in this context. The family of Jesus, the brothers, by which I mean the cousins. Not the time to talk about how they're not children of Mary. And so Jesus has his own struggles with the family. And all those who follow him will have similar struggles. Isn't it Peter's wife? Who Peter's wife's mother, who's grouchy, when Jesus cured her, or rather, or before Jesus had cured her, there's all kinds of family issues that people have. Maybe she's grouchy because Peter's going off, not doing the fishing. He's, he's kind of following Jesus around. So, this, this section of Luke has no bearing on the point that Ray Comfort's trying to allege. In fact, we can say that of all those who hear the word of God, Mary is the foremost who keeps it. Remember what Elizabeth said? Chapter 1, verse 45. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfilment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. 
So she's blessed because, according to Elizabeth, she's blessed because she believed that what would be spoken to her from the Lord would be fulfilled. That's contrasted with Zechariah, her husband, um, Elizabeth's husband, who seemed to have doubted and therefore was struck dumb. So Mary kept the word and all through her life she accepted her role and that Jesus was for, her, for God before her. So this is a, a roundabout affirmation of Mary by Jesus. But I think that's enough to show that Ray's landed flat on his face yet again. And I'm beginning to get a bit worried now that we might not be able to leave Catholicism and all that stuff that's left us in darkness behind and join Ray on his mission to save the world. Anyway, let's see what else he's got to say, because hope is not all lost yet. Indulgences. Historical Catholicism reveals indulgences were sold as a means to reduce time in purgatory for sins. The Bible has no support for the practice of indulgences. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now this, if you accepted the doctrine of justification by faith alone, then absolutely raise home and dry. And this verse is using to buttress that doctrine. You're saved through faith by grace. Not a gift of works. That's totally Catholic doctrine. Firstly, we, um, a person outside the Catholic Church, can do all the works under the sun. They're not going to get him to heaven. There's a dogma, no salvation outside the Catholic Church, which is there in the Catechism, around paragraph 847, thereabouts which talks to some extent about this, not fully, but it's a catechism, it's got to be brief. So you're not just saved through works. But if you're a Catholic and you don't believe, you're not going to go to heaven. So you've got to have faith, but it's got to operate. And St. James says this, it can't be a, a faith that's in suspended animation. This is James 2, verse 14. And this is to show that, yes, you're saved through faith, but it has to be faith working through love. What does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but has not works? Can his faith save him? And that's obviously a rhetorical device for saying, no, it can't. If he's got faith alone, but no works, is damned. Verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Without faith, there's no salvation. As Paul tells us in Ephesians, And as he says in verse 24 of the same chapter, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So you must have both. And the works that you're justified by will be in the context of a faithful life, a faith-filled life. But if it's the gift of God, not of works, as our friend Ray says here, what works is he talking about? Because James has just said we need works, and that just that justifies us, along with faith. Well, here Paul is talking about works of the law, you know, all that ceremonial stuff. Jews do it now, they put these things on their head, these black things, um, and, and wrap stuff around their arms. And then there's um, all the Jewish practices, their feasts, and so on. St. Paul talks about them. None of this can save you. It's ceremonial stuff. But 
the works that you do need are, as James says, like feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. These are like part of the corporal works of mercy, as we Catholics say. And they must be done, otherwise there'll be no salvation, even if you have faith. And I tell you, it's not just my interpretation. If a Protestant thinks, oh, no, no, you're misinterpreting this, then take one of your greatest lights, Martin Luther. He regarded the letter of James as of the lowest of the low, not inspired, shouldn't have been put in scripture. An epistle of straw, he said, because he knew what it meant. He knew it contradicted his doctrine of salvation by faith alone. That is, he knew it contradicted Ray Comfort's doctrine. So, given that you are not saved by faith alone, we come then to indulgences, because now we're open to the possibility of indulgences. What we do, what we can say is, yes, the word indulgence doesn't appear in scripture. Neither does the word Trinity. Neither does the word Bible. So a word not appearing is not in itself um, a problem. But is there effectively the power for the church to grant an indulgence? What is an indulgence then? <laughs> for saying what, what one does with it and so on. It is basically um, the I've already confirmed that purgatory exists, that most of us will go there and we're in there and we're being um, subjects to the purifying fire. Purifying is the key word there. Now, it isn't a pleasant place in the sense that it's purifying fire, but it is a very pleasant place in the sense that it is a place of union with God. There's a certain union with God in purgatory and there's an understanding this is necessary. I suppose... I wouldn't quite say it like this, but it's like a tooth extraction. You've got a bad tooth. So you've got to come out. And as it's coming out, you are suffering. But you know, it's really, really, really worth it. Because otherwise, if you don't go to that dentist, you're going to be in more and more pain. And in fact, in the end, you know, you could be in serious trouble. So you embrace the pain of the extraction. That's as far as I can go with analogies on purgatory, right now anyway. So you're in purgatory. People can pray for you that you be granted relief. That's fine. But if you see in Matthew's Gospel as something else, something the church has, Now, there's a passage which is commonly used in relation to the papacy. And I didn't use it at the very beginning, Ray's first shot at the church, which went well wide. But I'll just use it now. Jesus speaks to Peter, who has said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus tells him he's blessed for that because God revealed this to him and he says and I tell you you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it and here's coming the key thing I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What this means is the term, key term, whatever. Whatever in the spiritual realm you bind. This is a power given to Peter alone. He can exercise it alone. The church can exercise it collectively. That is the priest, the the, the bishops collectively can exercise it with um, the successor of Peter. The power to bind and loose. Whatever spiritual thing you bind on earth or you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So that means 
the, the treasury of merits, all the merits that have the unfathomable riches that have been accrued by Christ's death on the cross, plus the additional ones, which are not strictly necessary because Christ's merits are infinite. But nonetheless, we all do our best to contribute, and that is a fact, because in Colossians 1.24, I can say it faster than I can get there, St. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So the things we can do, which kind of God has carved out a space for us, so we can contribute. And so we have all these, the treasury of merits, as it's called, and one can draw, the church can draw upon that to bestow what are called indulgences. And these are basically um, gifts of the church to reduce the period of experience of um, the suffering soul in purgatory. We can get indulgences for ourselves as well. They can be, um, under certain, con certain conditions, you can get an indulgence so that you would have n no time to be spent in purgatory. I might say this is mechanistic. Well, it's not because, because, oh, they're also partial indulgences, so it limits the, um, the experience in purgatory. But you have to have confessed your sins sincerely, received absolution for those sins, that is, they're wiped off, and you have to be in a state of grace. You can't just roll up with a bag of money um, and give that and get the indulgence. And in fact, there were abuses of that in the, um, in the 16th century, the 15th. 16th century and the church in the 16th century at the Council of Trent condemned any association of indulgences with money but the root of indulgences because Ray talked about historical Catholicism allowed this but no it's not true historically bad Catholics did this but the church never taught that you can sell indulgences never but the key point is the scriptural reference is there in Peter. And if you look, go to the early church, the martyrs, those who are about to be sacrificed in the Roman arena or other arenas, the bishops, the priests would often um, ask for um, letters of commendation from them for the, um, for the ordinary Christian. as a kind of primitive indulgence. So, Although the historical record doesn't show them in a formal way as we know them today, until the 11th century, still you've got the scripture and practice of the early church, which justifies this. So Ray doesn't quite hit the mark there, because there's no reason to reject the idea of development of doctrine, provided, as St. Vincent of Lorraine said, you have a development within the proper lines of development. As a, as a baby becomes a, a, a child, becomes a man, becomes an old person. That's all development within its proper lines. Of course, the development outside of those lines is improper and is a deviation. But the, from what I've set out, you can have a development from Scripture to the doctrine of indulgences. Right, so that's dealing with that. Objection of Ray's. Let's see what he has next.